Tom here. If you're seeing this, it's because I couldn't think of a more clever cold open, so I thought I'd just put a clip here and maybe play with some of the filters and gadgets on my video editing software just to see what they can do. Because, you know, I've only played with it so much. Uh, you know, I've, I'm usually busy just doing editing videos and stuff, but I never get a chance to really play with all the fi filters and features and gizmos and whatnot. So if you're seeing this and you're probably seeing some weird funny effects and stuff, so uh, enjoy! Greetings one and all and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. I'm feeling some backtracks today. How about that, huh? Yeah, I imagine that. I'm bringing you backtracks when the month is maybe halfway over. <laughs> I know, right? Backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five, with at least one Spotlight album review. So, let's see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of May 2020. In May of 1955, Doris Day released her album Love Me or Leave Me, consisting of studio versions of songs heard in the movie of the same name, as was common practice with most pseudo-soundtrack albums of the period. It was the best-selling album of Day's career and spent nine of its 15 weeks on the Billboard Albums chart in the number one position. The single I'll Never Stop Loving You was a top 20 hit. The album also included her renditions of You Made Me Love You, I Didn't Want to Do It, and the title track. Also released 65 years ago this month was Study in Brown by trumpeter Clifford Brown and drummer Max Roach. Joined by Harold Land on saxophone, Richie Powell on piano, and George Morrow on double bass, the album includes mostly original compositions by members of the band, as well as Cherokee by Ray Noble, and the jazz classic Take the A-Train by Billy Strayhorn. The songs Sandu, composed by Brown, and Land's End, composed by Land, have since become jazz standards in their own right. Six decades ago this month saw the release of George Jones' ninth album, George Jones Salutes Hank Williams. Jones, who cited Williams as his greatest musical influence, recorded this album in one session, which, according to guitarist Jimmy Capps, lasted only three hours. Although it didn't actually chart, it became one of Jones' most successful albums. It features Jones' renditions of some of the biggest hits from Williams' short career, including Hey Good Lookin', Cold Cold Heart, Jambalaya, Honky Tonkin', and Settin' the Woods on Fire. Also released in May of 1960 was the Everly Brothers' third album, It's Everly Time. Their first album on the Warner Brothers label, it peaked at number 9 on the Billboard Albums chart. Along with their versions of Ray Charles' What Kind of Girl Are You and the Fats Domino tune, I Want You to Know, the album includes the classic song, Memories Are Made of This, as well as the Don Everly pen song, So Sad to Watch Good Love Go Bad, which was a top 10 single on the Billboard chart. Fifty-five years ago this month, Astrid Gilberto released her debut album, The Astrid Gilberto Album. Produced by Creed Taylor, arranged by Marty Page, and featuring Antonio Carlos Jobim on guitar, it reached number 41 on the Billboard 200 during its 18-week chart run. It includes several Jobim-written classics such as Photograph, Agua de Beber, How Insensitive, and Gingy. In 2017, NPR included it on their list of the 150 greatest albums made by women. Also making his debut in May of 1965 was Tom Jones with his first album, Along Came Jones. It reached number 11 on the UK Albums Chart, and when released two months later in the US under the title It's Not Unusual, it reached number 54. The album consisted mostly of covers such as the Johnny Mercer classic Autumn Leaves, the traditional tune It Takes a Worried Man, and the Chuck Berry song Memphis. But its biggest hit was written specifically for Jones, It's Not Unusual was a number one smash in the UK and a top ten single in the US, and became Jones' signature song. The single and the album earned Jones the Grammy for Best New Artist. Celebrating its 50th anniversary this month is Woodstock, music from the original soundtrack and more. This triple album consisting of recordings from the legendary 1969 festival, films of which were assembled into a documentary, spent over a year on the Billboard Albums chart and four weeks at the number one spot. It includes activist anthems of the time, such as the I Feel Like I'm Fixin' to Die Rag by Country Joe McDonald and Freedom, Motherless Child by Richie Havens, as well as performances by Santana, Jimi Hendrix, John Sebastian, and Crosby, Stills & Nash. The album eventually achieved double platinum certification and has since been inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. Also released in May of 1970 was Writer, the debut album by Carole King. She wouldn't find success as a performer until her follow-up album Tapestry a year later, but the strength of her songwriting partnership with Jerry Goffin was on full display here, as she performed songs she wrote that had been hits for The Drifters, Up on the Roof, which reached number four in the U.S., and Dusty Springfield, Going Back, which went top ten in the U.K., or would be later on, such as I Can't Hear You No More, which was a top 40 hit for Helen Reddy in 1976. 
In May of 1975, The Captain and Tennille released their debut album, Love Will Keep Us Together. It spent two years on the Billboard 200 chart, peaking at number two, and achieved gold certification by the RIAA. The title track, first recorded by Neil Sedaka two years earlier, no, it wasn't a Captain and Tennille original, claimed the number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100 for four weeks and the Adult Contemporary chart for one week. Follow-up single, The Way I Want to Touch You, topped the Adult Contemporary chart for two weeks and reached number four on the Hot 100. Both singles reached the UK Top 40. Daryl Dragon, the captain, and Tony Tennille first met through their association with the Beach Boys, and perhaps inevitably, four songs on the album were written or co-written by members of that group, including the Captain and Tennille's rendition of God Only Knows, as well as the first album release ever of I Write the Songs, which Barry Manilow would make a chart-topping hit later that year. Ironic, isn't it, that I Write the Songs wasn't written by Barry Manilow? Also released 45 years ago this month was Natalie Cole's debut album, Inseparable. During its chart run of more than a year, it peaked at number 18 on the Billboard 200 while topping the Billboard Soul Albums chart. It earned gold certification by the RIAA and scored her a Grammy Award for Best New Artist. Lead-off single, This Will Be an Everlasting Love, topped the Billboard R&B Singles chart for two weeks, was a top 10 hit on the Billboard Hot 100, a top 20 single in Canada, and reached the top 40 of the UK. The title track went top 40 on the Billboard Hot 100 and topped the Billboard R&B Singles chart. This Will Be made Natalie Cole only the second artist ever to win the Grammy Award for Best Female R&B Vocal Performance, which Aretha Franklin had swept for eight straight years, ever since the award's inception in 1968. Happy 40th anniversary this month to Devo's third album, Freedom of Choice. It peaked at number 22 on the Billboard 200 and was a top 10 album in both Australia and New Zealand. It eventually went platinum in the US. It spawned the group's highest charting single, Whip It, which reached number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 11 in Canada and New Zealand. Other singles include Girl You Want, which was later recorded by Soundgarden and Robert Palmer, Gates of Steel, which received interpretations from Yola Tengo and The Flaming Lips, and the title track, which was covered by A Perfect Circle and The Aquabats. The lyrics to Whip It were inspired by such varied things as communist propaganda posters, Norman Vincent Peale's book The Power of Positive Thinking, and then-U.S. President Jimmy Carter. May of 1980 also saw the release of Diana Ross's 10th solo album, Diana. During its year-long run on the Billboard 200 chart, it peaked at number two for two weeks. It topped the Swedish album chart and was a top 10 album in Norway, the Netherlands, and Germany. It was her most successful album and achieved platinum certification in the U.S. First single, Upside Down, spent four weeks at the top of both the Billboard Hot 100 and Billboard Soul Singles charts, and was also a number one hit in Australia, Italy, South Africa, and five other countries, and reaching number two in the U.K. Follow-up single, I'm Coming Out, was also a hit, peaking at number five on the Hot 100 and topping the Billboard Soul Singles chart, and going top ten in France and top twenty in the UK. I'm Coming Out has since secured its place in history as one of the most popular anthems for the LGBTQ community. In May of 1985, Dire Straits released their fifth album, Brothers in Arms. It topped the album's charts in at least a dozen countries, including nine weeks at number one in the US, 14 weeks at the top spot in the UK, 10 of those weeks consecutively, and 34 weeks at the top of the Australian Albums chart. It holds nine times platinum certification in the US and was the first album in the UK to be certified 10 times platinum. Single Money for Nothing topped the Billboard Hot 100 for three weeks, also reached number one in Canada, and peaked at number four in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. It also won a Grammy for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals. Subsequent single, Walk of Life, hit the number two spot on the UK singles chart and went top ten in the US. Brothers in Arms was one of the first albums made specifically for the then young compact disc format, having been recorded, mixed, and mastered entirely in the digital realm. It was also the first release to sell one million copies on CD, and the first release that sold more on CD than it did on vinyl. Also released 35 years ago this month was Youthquake, the sophomore album by Dead or Alive. It peaked at number 8 in Canada, number 9 in the UK, was a top 20 album in Switzerland and Australia, and reached number 31 on the Billboard 200. Its biggest single and the group's biggest hit was You Spin Me Round Like a Record, which topped the singles charts in the UK, Canada, and Switzerland, went top 5 in Australia and Germany, and reached number 11 in the US. Second single, Lover Come Back to Me, was a top 5 single in Switzerland and a top 20 hit in Australia. That single and In Too Deep both went top 20 in the UK. May of 1990 saw the release of Wilson Phillips, the self-titled debut album by the trio of Shina Phillips, daughter of John and Michelle Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas, and sisters Carney and Wendy Wilson, daughters of Beach Boy Brian Wilson, topped the album's chart in Canada, peaked at number two on the Billboard 200, and reached number seven on the Australian and UK albums charts. 
Three of the album's first four singles, Hold On, Release Me, and You're In Love, topped the Billboard Hot 100 with Impulsive reaching number four. In Canada, Release Me and Impulsive hit number one, while Hold On and You're In Love both peaked at number three. Fifth single, The Dream Is Still Alive, reached number four on both the U.S. and Canadian adult contemporary charts and the top 15 of both countries' primary singles charts. Also released three decades ago this month was Billy Idol's fourth album, Charmed Life. It peaked in the top five of the Canadian, German, New Zealand, and Norwegian album charts, reached number 11 in both the U.S. and Australia, and climbed to number 15 in the U.K. Lead single, Cradle of Love, which appeared on the soundtrack of the film The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, was his second highest charting single and only his fourth to break the top 10 of the Billboard Hot 100. It was a top 10 hit in Japan, Italy, Finland, Australia, and Canada. Follow-up single, a cover of The Doors song L.A. Woman, peaked outside the U.S. Top 50. A quarter of a century ago this month, Take That released Nobody Else, their third album and their last before they disbanded for 11 years. It reached number one on the album charts in nine countries, including the UK, Italy, and Germany. It peaked at number two in Australia and Spain, and was a top ten album in Japan, Iceland, Chile, and Zimbabwe. The album produced the group's biggest hit single, Back for Good, which topped the charts in 11 countries, including the UK, Australia, Canada, and Latvia. The album's other singles, Sure and Never Forget, both hit number one in the UK and the top five in Italy and Denmark. The album was the group's first to be released in the US three months later, with an altered track list and a different cover image, omitting Robbie Williams, who had officially left the group the month before. Also released in May of 1995 was Everclear's sophomore album Sparkle and Fade. It peaked at number 25 on the Billboard 200 and achieved platinum certification by the RIAA a year after release. Among the album's tracks, whose lyrics reflected frontman Art Alexakis' troubled youth, include the singles Heroin Girl, which reached the top 40 of the U.S. and Canadian Alternative Songs chart, Heart Spark Dollar Sign, which went top 20 on the same two charts, and Santa Monica, which was a top 40 hit on the Billboard Hot 100 and topped the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart for three weeks. Both Santa Monica and Heart Spark Dollar Sign also charted in the top 50 of the U.K. singles chart. Happy 20th anniversary this month to Matchbox 20's sophomore album, Mad Season. Released three and a half years after their debut, it peaked at number three on the Billboard 200 during its 77-week chart run, and within a year and a half was certified quadruple platinum in the U.S. It also reached number three in Canada and topped the Australian album's chart. Among the six singles released from the album were Bent, which was a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100 and the Canadian singles chart, if You're Gone, which went top 5 in the US, top 20 in Australia and New Zealand, and top 40 in Canada, and the title track, which made the top 40 in New Zealand, but narrowly missed it in the US and Australia, although it did hit number 5 on the US Adult Top 40 chart. Also in May of 2000, Eminem released his third album, The Marshall Mathers LP. It spent eight weeks at number one on the Billboard 200, was the second best-selling album of the year, and currently holds eight times platinum certification in the U.S. It topped the album's charts in 11 other countries, including Canada, the U.K., and Australia, and was a top ten album in at least ten more countries. First single, The Real Slim Shady, reached number four on the Billboard Hot 100 and number one on the U.K. singles chart, and scored Eminem a Grammy for Best Rap Solo Performance. Subsequent single, Stan, featuring Dido, reached number one in 12 countries, including the UK, Australia, Denmark, and Romania, and gave rise to the title being used as a slang term for an obsessive fan of celebrities. The album sparked controversy for its misogynistic and homophobic lyrics, and nearly got Eminem banned from Canada. Nevertheless, it won the Grammy for Best Rap Album and got nominated for Album of the Year, and ended up on numerous year-end best lists. In May of 2005, Fall Out Boy released their sophomore album and major label debut, From Under the Cork Tree. It spent 14 weeks in the top 20 of the Billboard 200, two of them at its peak position of number 9, and eventually went double platinum in the US. It was a number one album in Canada and reached the top 10 of the Irish and New Zealand album charts. Its first two singles, Sugar We're Going Down and Dance Dance, were top 10 hits on both the UK singles chart and the Billboard Hot 100. Follow-up single, A Little Less Sixteen Candles, A Little More Touch Me, made the UK Top 40. And as a trivia note, the album track originally titled My Name is David Ruffin and These Are the Temptations quite literally earned its eventual title. Our lawyer made us change the name of the song so we wouldn't get sued. This month also marks the 15th anniversary of the release of Paul Anka's album Rock Swings. This album of jazz interpretations of rock and pop songs from the 80s and 90s, including Michael Jackson's The Way You Make Me Feel, R.E.M.'s Everybody Hurts, Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit, and Eric Clapton's Tears in Heaven reached number two on the Billboard Jazz Albums chart, was a top ten album in the UK, and went gold in Anka's native Canada. 
And a clever in-joke, uh, the opening track on this album, a cover of Bon Jovi's It's My Life, includes the lyric, like Frankie said, I did it my way. The lyrics to the Sinatra classic My Way were written by Paul Anka. Released 10 years ago this month was the self-titled debut album by Courtyard Hounds, the side project by Marty McGuire and Emily Robson of the Dixie Chicks. Recorded mostly in McGuire's home studio in Austin, Texas, it peaked at number 7 on the Billboard 200 and number 6 in Canada. It also charted in Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, and the UK. Even though it was a country album, it reached number 3 on the Billboard Rock Albums chart. Lead-off single, The Coast, peaked in the top 40 of the Billboard Adult Alternative Songs chart. Subsequent single, See You in the Spring, was a duet with Jacob Dylan. Also released in May of 2010 was The Black Keys' sixth album, Brothers. It was the band's first top 10 album on the Billboard 200, peaking at number 3, and eventually being certified platinum. It also reached number 3 in Denmark, number 4 in Canada, and number 8 in Australia. First single, Tighten Up, produced by Danger Mouse, spent 10 weeks at the top of the Billboard Alternative Songs chart, and also hit number 1 on the Billboard Rock Songs chart and earned a Grammy nomination for Best Rock Song and a Grammy win for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals. Follow-up single, Howlin' For You, hit the top five on the same two charts. Both singles reached the top 60 of the Canadian Singles Chart. The album won a Grammy Award for Best Alternative Music Album and was the first album recorded at legendary Muscle Shoals Sound Studio in Alabama in almost 30 years. May of 2015 saw the release of The Waterfall, the seventh album by My Morning Jacket. It was their first album in almost four years, and it took 18 months to record. It peaked at number 20 in Canada, number 11 in the U.S., and number 2 on both the Billboard Alternative Albums and Rock Albums charts. Two of the album's three singles appeared on the Billboard Adult Alternative Songs chart. Big Decisions hit the top 10, and Compound Fracture went top 20. The album cover is an artificially colored image of Vernal Fall in Yosemite National Park, which you might remember you saw me admiring in the window of Everyday Music in my last Portland video. Also released five years ago this month was Zed's sophomore album, True Colors. It spent 20 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart, peaking at number four. It reached number six in Canada and number eight in Norway, and was a top 20 album in Sweden, Australia, and Japan. Lead-off single, I Want You To Know, featuring Selena Gomez, reached the top 20 of singles charts in the US, the UK, and Canada. Other singles include Beautiful Now, featuring John Bellion, and Papercut, featuring Troy Sivan. Among other artists making contributions to the album were Echo Smith, Logic, and X Ambassadors. Okay, it is Spotlight Album time, and I've only got one Spotlight Album for you guys this month, uh, but for a couple of good reasons. Uh, for one thing, it is a big album. Uh, maybe not big in terms of its notoriety or its uh, profile in the music world, uh, but then again, it is only five years old, so if we just give it some time, it will probably become big in that respect. You'll see what I mean in, when I talk about it in a minute. But uh, it is a big album in terms of its runtime. Yes, it is a triple album, not even a double album. It's a triple album, almost three hours long. So uh, yeah, if I'm going to invest listening to an album for three hours, you guys ain't getting another Spotlight album from me in the same month. Sorry. Uh, but uh, uh, there are a couple other reasons why I decided to go with the album that I chose. Uh, I don't think I told you, but last month, both of the Spotlight albums I did last month, I only paid a dollar a piece for. And the two albums before that in... Uh, which would have been March, I think I paid less than $10 for both of them combined. So yeah, in the last two months, four Spotlight albums I paid less than $15 for. So uh, I thought it was time for me to splurge a bit. And not that I really owe you guys anything because you guys don't pay to subscribe to this to this channel. I mean, I, I suppose you do invest time in watching my videos. So maybe because of that, I kind of feel way in the back of my, my mind like I, like I owe you something. So I wanted to kind of go all out, and uh, also, since I fortunately have the means to do so, it was an opportunity for me to um, support my local store, as uh, they all the record stores in the world need their, as much support as they can get right now with all the closures. Uh, so yeah, this was my way of doing that, and also, uh, yet another reason was I had been meaning to check out this artist in depth for the last several uh, months, last year or so, and since I saw that his album was coming up on an anniversary, this was the perfect time. The album I'm talking about, without further ado, is The Epic by Kamasi Washington. Yes, this is a three-disc a three -disc album, as I mentioned, and it is gloriously packaged. I mean, you can see the three uh, record sleeves. Yes, they all have their in own individual outer sleeves. You can see here. And in each outer sleeve, it's sleeved inside of an inner paper sleeve. So. Yes, they did not skimp on the packaging for this. 
Uh, just a fantastic album. And I am telling you this, Kamasi Washington had a lot of balls. Uh, this was his first non-self-released album, and not only did he put out a triple album as his first, you know, his first uh, label album, I guess you'd say, but calling it the epic was, as I said, kind of ballsy on his part. Uh, but honestly, the name of this album fits. This was this wasn't just a listen; it was a journey. I'm telling you, this is fantastic. This uh, Kamathi Washington, uh, before I go any further, is a jazz saxophonist, as you can see here, as he's got carrying the saxophone, cradling the saxophone in his arms, as you can as you can see here. And uh, it's through the course of this album, it's three hours. He touches on just about every subgenre of jazz that you can possibly imagine. Uh, it goes from the the more improv, freeform kind of stuff, which, and that's what track one was. So I was a little bit afraid uh, when I was first listening to to that track that oh my god, this thing is going to be all uh, improv stuff. That And you, you guys know that I'm not much into improv freeform jazz, so I was starting to get afraid that this whole album was going to be a bust. I did stream the first 45 minutes of it uh, before deciding to buy it. Of course, you know, this is a... Uh, let's just say it's more than $40. This uh, set was more than $40, so I was not going to fork over that kind of cash for something I had not listened to a minute of. So, yeah, I, I did do my homework on this before, but... Uh, but yeah, I, I decided halfway through that first track, uh, change of the guard, just let go. Don't f be afraid of whether or not you're going to like this. Just turn off your brain and listen. And so I did. And I just listened to all three of these albums with no expectations, um, no fears about whether or not I was going to like it or not. And as I said, it really took me on a journey. I mean, Kamasi Washington is wickedly talented on the saxophone, and he composes nearly every song on here. There are a couple of covers, uh, and uh, Thundercat is uh, a, the electric bassist on this album, and uh, and I mentioned a minute ago that it covers pretty much every subgenre of jazz. Most of this is instrumental, but there are a couple of vocal songs, and two of the vocalists who give their tremendous talents to this album are Patrice Quinn and Dwight Tribble, and they are both just fantastic on their songs, and every song on this album is just fantastic in one way or another. Um, Isabel is one that, uh, that's track two, and that kind of, uh, you know, after the first track that kind of left me iffy, as I said, that track is kind of the one that galvanized me and really made me get into and listen to the album. Isabel is a great track. Uh, on volume, yeah, volume one is called The Plan, volume two is The Glorious Tale, and volume three is called The Historic Repetition. And uh, on volume two, uh, he actually does uh, two different arrangements of the same composition, uh, his own composition. On Volume 2, it's called Rerun, and he reprises it on Volume 3, it's called Rerun Home. And on Rerun Home, he does a bit more of a an Afro-Cuban beat. It, it reminds me of Santana, is, is what the rhythm reminds me of, and so that, that's why Afro-Cuban is just what comes to mind. Uh, and yeah, that one, I think that one is the superior of the two arrangements of that song, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, Misunderstanding is uh, one of the great songs, one of the more upbeat songs. Uh, and Cherokee, I mentioned, and I actually didn't realize this until I was finalizing the notes for this video. Uh, the first, uh, the second album that I mentioned in my shout outs, Study in Brown by Clifford Brown, uh, he does a cover of Cherokee on, ha on that album. And Kamathi Washington does a, uh, a vocal cover of Cherokee on this album. But yeah, just a fantastic uh, album. And a rerun home, I mentioned that one. And he also does on volume three, on side B, he does a jazz arrangement of a classical composition, Claire de Lune by Claude Debussy. And just a fantastic, a bit a bit of an upbeat uh, arrangement of that. And uh, yeah, just and he does a, a song on on volume three called Malcolm's Theme, and that interpolates a soundbite from uh, Malcolm X speech. So that that's where the title Malcolm's Theme comes in. So uh, yeah, just so much uh, meaningful stuff on this album. And as I said, he touches on nearly every subgenre of jazz from the uh, the freeform improv kind of stuff, as I mentioned, to uh, small jazz combo nightclub jazz kind of stuff from the 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, to the more contemporary kind of vocal jazz. Um, the songs that Patrice Quinn uh, sang on, at least one of them, kind of gave me a bit of a, uh, a Liz Wright vibe. Uh, I've mentioned Liz Wright before. She's a contemporary jazz vocalist. Uh, just great stuff. And uh, and just, yeah, just, you would not get bored listening to this album. It is, you know, at three hours long, it is a long listen. So I would recommend digesting it one volume at a time. Uh, and that, that's what I did. And that's why. 
it's only one spotlight album this month so i can only do to do so much people but this it was just fantastic as i said this was not just a listen this was a journey uh, and i am definitely going to uh at some point check out uh kamasi washington has made one album since this one i believe just one since this and i think it's uh, not as long thankfully but uh yeah just a fantastic uh album uh, an, an epic uh, yes, this album was, he, he was ballsy titling it the epic, but it is an apt title for this album. Just a fantastic journey into the world of jazz. Um, I don't know if I'd recommend it if uh, to people who are new to jazz, but if you've got a bit of a seasoned ear, if you, if you like jazz, or if you like to be adventurous with your jazz, you've got to stream the epic by Kamasi Washington. A fantastic set of albums. Yeah, my one worry... Uh, right now is that I'm hoping that this has not uh, completely ruined it for all the other spotlight albums I may do uh, throughout the rest of this year. I'm kind of hoping that we haven't, uh, I haven't hit my peak with spotlight albums before the year's halfway over. Uh, but uh, hey, there's a chance of that. And uh, well, that's one of the great things about Backtracks is I, I don't know what I'm going to hit, um, what I'm going to happen upon uh, month by month as the year goes on. So, uh, but anyway, That'll do it for Backtracks for the month of May 2020, and that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Suggestions, questions, constructive criticisms, lay them on me in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.